sorry professors, but I hardly remember anything about my anthropology degree, what I learned. Um, but my senior year, I took a class called The Philosophy of Religion by uh, Thomas O'Meara, a theologian. <laughs> and I remember the first day of class, we had a blackboard like this. And I can't believe we still have blackboards like this. But uh, he drew this on the board. I don't know if you can read that from there, but on the left is every sort of endeavor, every academic or mental endeavor that you could hope to think about, and then converging lines on this thing called X. And a professor told us there's one way you can fail this class. Everyone is going to pass this class, unless you do one thing, unless you name X. You can't name X for this class, but you kind of know what he was talking about, the G word. But you couldn't name it, because as soon as you name it, uh, you start putting characteristics on it. And that stuck with me through my whole life. And it helped me to not divide uh, the sublime from the profane, but the body from the soul, the body from the rest of the world. And everything is converging on that X. And that's a little bit what I want to talk about in the second half of the talk today. So our trigger alert, we're in 2018, and disclaimer. Uh, the trigger alert is there are a couple of really gruesome slides here that are not put in gratuitously, but to tell a story about global surgery. And I'll warn you, if you don't want to look at those, uh, that, that that's gonna come up. And uh, it involves a child. The child survives, but has a, has a somewhat unhappy outcome. So I don't want to shock anybody with that. Disclaimer, I'm not a theologian or a philosopher, so I'm very thin ice up here talking to you about those. So those of you who I think are theologians or philosophers out there, come up to me afterwards, don't blow me out of the water up here. I'll talk to orthopedics. I'll, I'll talk to orthopedics or hand surgery with you. Um, so part one is going to talk about global surgery, uh, this kind of academic uh, endeavor that's just starting in the last couple of years. Part two is going to talk about why would we do that, and it doesn't have to be surgery. Why would we do that as pediatricians or dermatologists or golfers or shoemakers or anything else? Why would our profession? Uh, be related to our faith, and I want to just think about that a little bit. Um, and in particular, is this a pointer? Yeah. I want to look at uh, brokenness and chaos in the world, which doesn't need much explanation. I want to talk about this world, this word called lagos, which comes close to failing the class here. And I want to talk about the tension between this chaos we see in the world and lagos. And I think in that tension is where as Catholics and Christians or people of any faith, I think in that tension is where we live. And how do we deal with that tension? And then part three is a blowout in the cold. <laughs> so global surgery, I want to tell a tale of two children. One is named Ahmed and one is named Jane. And these two children are the same age and they have the same injury. Um, they, their only difference is the setting in which they had their injury. Jane had her injury here. This is Kajabi Hospital, uh, where I lived for three and a half years. It's in the bush. There's monkeys jumping on the roof. Uh, cows are killed by predators from time to time. Um, it's a rural hospital in Kenya, but it's a very, very high-functioning hospital. It's known all throughout East Africa. And Jane was fortunate enough to have her injury on the campus, uh, the school just adjacent to this hospital. So within an hour, she was in our x-ray department, had a good quality x-ray done that allowed us to make a diagnosis. She had an anesthetist. She had safe anesthesia. She had a pulse oximeter. She had a C-arm, an intraoperative x-ray device, so you can take x-rays during surgery. A very expensive machine donated to the hospital, but it allows the surgery to be done without incisions, just percutaneously. And she had autoclaves available for sterile technique. And these are the basics of surgery. Now let's talk about Ahmed. Ahmed is uh, Somali. Uh, Kenya shares a border with southern Somalia, as well as Ethiopia and South Sudan and Ethiopia. And that border, that northern border of Kenya, is outside sovereignty, outside the rule of law. Um, there's a line on a map that nobody pays attention to, and there's no police force or military force that
that would stand a chance there because it is lawless. And this is the setting in which Ahmed got hurt. He just fell out of a tree and broke his humerus, broke his elbow, uh, low energy injury. St. Joe's here probably sees multiple a week of this type of injury. Not a dramatic injury, but Ahmed had no access to proper health care. So his only uh, opportunity was to revert to local bone centers, who often do a fantastic job with uh, no resources available. This is not Ahmed, this is just a, a screen graph. Uh, but these bone centers will use what's available to try to set the bones, no anesthesia, uh, hold the bones in proper position uh, to allow bones to heal with no access to surgery, anesthesia, or x-ray. And these are throughout uh, Africa, these types of traditional bone centers. Now, I think I have a slide here. There's a gory slide coming up. So graphic images to follow if you don't want to see this. So this is Ahmed's presentation to our hospital. He was two weeks out from his injury. He'd been to a traditional bone center and had a very tight uh, splint applied, which had led to compartment syndrome, which is incredibly painful, uh, increased pressure in the arm, which cuts off the circulation to the muscles and the nerves. Very painful and leads to tissue death. And Ahmed had become infected and was septic, uh, so he came to us near death, semi-conscious, but he was holding his cloak over his face because he couldn't stand the stench of his rotting arm. And so we fluid hydrated him, we gave him antibiotics, and we got him to theater to save his life, uh, to do an amputation. And so emergency operation, amputation, near death for a simple injury. This is global surgery. This is the outcome. This is my daughter Jane on an island about a mile offshore from our house in Ireland, joyfully kayaking out there with her arm. And Ahmed, with one arm, returns to that barren region where deformity and disability are often seen as a spiritual curse. So not only is he physically disabled, but he's shunned from his people because something's wrong with him spiritually. And that's the difference uh, in access. That's the only difference between those two. And that, that tugs at my heart, uh, and that gives me a uh, passion to want to do something about that. Um, and we're gonna, so this, I say, only as an example of what's to follow as we discuss why you might do something like that. So global surgery um, is the idea that there is a public health element to surgery. So in the global health uh, community, surgery has for a long time been seen as far too expensive, far too consumptive of resources to consider doing in these limited resource settings. Um, rightfully so throughout history, public health for the world for example, through the World Health Organization, has focused on clean water and food and infectious diseases such as diarrhea that kills so many children, um, malaria, all these infectious diseases that we hear about in poorer countries that are starting to affect our uh, developed countries as well. But as the research started to come out, most of it through the World Health Organization, these uh, statistics came out that somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of uh, the global burden of disease in the world requires a trained surgeon to take care of that. There's about 313 million surgeries done per year, which is nine times the number of people living with HIV, just to put it in a public health perspective. And more, many more people die per year from injury or trauma or surgery-related diseases uh, than die from HIV, just to compare it again. So the poorest third of people on the planet receive almost no surgical care. So that includes cesarean section for obstructive labor, that includes an infected gallbladder or appendix, that includes cancer. They just have no access to safe anesthesia, obstetrical care, or surgery. And therefore, about 9% of all injury deaths occur in low-income countries. So five billion people, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation contributed a lot to coming up with these numbers, Five billion people on the planet don't have access to those basics. This is my waiting room at Kajabi, um, and it makes me just remember the desperation, just looking at that picture, that most of the world uh, doesn't have access to services. So until very recently, this has not been a public health issue for the World Health Organization, uh, the World Bank, et cetera. 
the sort of central moment here was just in 2015. Um, and this was uh, spearheaded by a Notre Dame graduate called John Mara. Uh, he's a classmate of mine here, a classmate of mine in Michigan, and we were roommates our last year at Michigan. Amazing guy, full professor at Harvard. He's not here, is he? I wouldn't say this if he was here. All right, he's a great guy. Um, <laughs> he, uh, and is the lead author on this uh, seminal work. The Lancet Journal, you're likely familiar with, British Medical Journal, decided to take this on as an important issue and has uh, dedicated a lot of pages of research uh, to this issue. Concurrent with this, the World Health Assembly, which is the governing body for the World Health Organization, came out with this very kind of bland statement, uh, which changes everything. And basically it says that the human right to health care, to universal health coverage, includes access to safe anesthesia and obstetrical care and surgical options in the world. It's an exciting time. I'm talking to the pre-med students last night and talking to medical students in Dublin. Uh, they're entering uh, this field at a, at a great time because there are academic disciplines developing. John's got a fellowship for either one or two years at Harvard that involves research, academic work, and also work in the field. And there's many other centers developing that. I get to go around and talk at orthopedic surgery residencies because they want to have available to their applicants, to their residency program, this global health rotation. Um, and they want to be able to tick that box because it's attractive to applicants. Uh, people are aware of that. Okay, that's part one. That's, that's my passion. That's what I'm interested in. Um, but uh, that's a very narrow field. And um, no matter what field you're in, uh, these same sorts of ideas, I hope, apply. So this, these are the kinds of things that spin around inside my head. So indulge me uh, as we do this. I'll read this poem to you. Turning and turning in the widening jar, the falcon, do not hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, and mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. Best by all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Well, it sounds like 2018 in a way, but Yates wrote this uh, in uh, between the two world wars. Okay, and he was envisioning just the world descending into chaos. And the second stanza of this poem describes the second coming, which is not Christ, but this pitiless beast uh, that is coming into the world. This world, this world. Yeats was a weird guy. He's Ireland's proudest poet, like he's a Nobel laureate, and they brag about him. But if you read about him, he's a very strange guy. He was into the occult, everything else, and it's a very dark poem. And it focuses on the collapse of structure, chaos entering the world. And that was his world view. I want to ask you this question. Why do we say that the world is broken? We can look at the world, and we don't need anyone to tell us that the world is chaotic. You know, college kids should be able to go into a, a bar in California and not worry about being shot. Uh, people should be able to go into a synagogue in Pennsylvania and not worry about this. Just before I left Dublin, I went to visit a friend in the hospital. He's 42 years old. He's married. He has three beautiful daughters, just about my daughter's age. Um, and he's, a, he's in the Anglican Church, and he's uh, been studying to be a priest. He's in the hospital because his brain meds have started trickling down uh, to, his, to his spinal cord roots, and so he became paralyzed and incontinent this past week. And he's going to be ordained a priest on Sunday, and I hope he's still alive when I get back on Monday. We don't need anyone to tell us about the chaos and the suffering and the, the mere anarchy loosed upon the world. We don't, we don't need to explain that very much. But why do we say that the world is broken? Because that would imply that there is an unbroken state of the world. We seem to have this instinct that young people shouldn't die, that there shouldn't be as much suffering in the world, um, which must mean that we have some other idea of the way the world is supposed to be. This idea, this line of reasoning, is actually what converted C.S. Lewis from being an atheist to a theist. It didn't bring him to be a Christian, but he couldn't understand how, when we look at the world, we have a sense of right and wrong, unless that sense came from outside. Um, why do we think that way? 
things fall apart. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even Jesus, right, experienced this desperation, this sense that this isn't right, this is wrong. Where are you, God? Even in his moment of, of grief as he cried out. So we aren't alone in this. And if, if you look at that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the opening words of Psalm 22. And as you read that through, you realize God has not forsaken him. That there is something, there's a meaning in that suffering that Christ is going through on the cross. So we'll have another poem here. This poem, where you see the word, word, this poem is written in Greek. And the word, word, in Greek is logos. Um, so in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came to be through him. And without him, nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. So that's a poem, really. It's the prologue of John's Gospel. We don't know who the author was. Maybe his name is John. Um, and that seems to be a different sort of a poem from Yeats' poem. This word logos, this word word, needs to be explored a little bit because the author, John, is using it in a very specific, a very uh, determined way because his audience were Jews of his time who were Hellenistic Jews. They were trained in Greek. They would have known Greek philosophy. And he was using this word logos in the way that we would have, he, that they would have understood. So what did it mean? He starts off with in the beginning. So another book starts that way. Genesis, the Bible, starts with in the beginning. So uh, the author is putting the logos at the beginning. He's putting Christ at the beginning of time in creation. And He's using that very specifically to reference the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. And then this word logos, it's a 500 year old word that the Hellenistic Jews around him would have understood very well, arising in ancient Greek philosophy, Heraclitus used the word. Heraclitus was called the philosopher of flux. He, was, he had this idea of the world was changing, interacting, kind of a yin and a yang sort of a thing. Uh, but that underneath that all was a structure and order that enveloped both the physical world and the moral world, and that there was one underlying force of structure or order in the world, and named Logos. Stoicism took this and developed it a little bit more and said this is the underlying principle of the universe, and it governs everything in the universe, including the physical world and the moral world. And so the author of John was applying this term very specifically to the Hellenistic Jews that were reading it. So do we see this kind of order in the universe? I first got interested in this when somebody pointed out to me, uh, uh, blank on the name here, um, Fibonacci sequence, right, which is used in computer programming and whatnot. I just think it's kind of fun to look at. You can look it up on the internet. But basically, you can create a series of numbers that are the sum of the two numbers before that. And it makes an infinite series of numbers, very boring. Except that the ratio between those numbers, 1.61 something, shows up again and again in the universe. So it shows up in subatomic particles, it shows up in galaxies in their rotation, it shows up in plants, the way they branch, it shows up in Roman architecture, in the ratios of the sides of the building. It shows up as a hand surgeon, it shows up in the ratio of the distal to the middle to the proximal phalanges to the metacarpals. There's no reason for that, it's just there. It's like a joke from God. <laughs> but it's there. So I went to see, so uh, the, the uh, sort of spirituality of the smart guys, Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein, often gets misquoted by Christians to say, look, they really did believe in God. And Stephen Hawking really did, and he said it over and over. Um, but he can still have this quote uh, where he definitely says there's an order in the universe that he recognizes, and he can't say where it comes from. There's an underlying order. There's a logos in the universe. Einstein was much more of a theist. He believed in a god. He didn't believe in a god you could pray to, or that you could ask things of, or that interacted with your world, or changed world events, anything like that. Uh, but he did believe that the universe was so shockingly structured that there had to be something underlying it. There had to be a force, a spirit uh, underlying it.
So now I want to talk about that order, logos versus the chaos. And I think this is where all of us live our lives. We live in this tension between walking through the world, using our senses to say, the world has beauty, but it has a lot of chaos. It has a lot of suffering. It has uh, joy, but it has a lot of sorrow as well. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like it should be that way. It feels like it should be another way. And we live right here in the middle in that tension between the two, if we look at it, if we take the time to sense that. I think we sense often uh, a disease or an unhappiness with the way things are. And I think that's where vocation can arise, where a calling can arise, is that place where you feel that tension, you spend time with that tension, um, and allow it to build you. Um, to me, I put a picture of the grotto in here, because the grotto represents to me a place set apart uh, where you can live in that tension. So you can go down there by yourself. You don't have to go to the grotto, but you can go down there by yourself. You don't have to talk to God. You can just sit on a bench and let him talk to you. You're not saying the Our Father or Hail Mary or anything like that. You're just being with God. And I think that's where uh, that Lagos talks to us. Um, I think there's a lot of other ways to do it. I think the rosary. Uh, when I see the, the women in church just praying the rosary over and over, that's a way of just erasing everything in your mind uh, and allowing God to speak to you. Meditation. Um, Jesuit spirituality is amazing how they will intentionally say, if you're making a big decision in your life, <laughs> don't make a checklist, don't make pros and cons. Go into a room, read a random Bible passage, let it flow through your mind, uh, and, don't, and don't try to come to a decision. And that's what it does. Uh, they're amazing, the Jesuits, the way they can look at that. Uh, Lectio Domine, or just the examine as they look at their day and say, what brings me, what brings me light, what brings me darkness, what brings me joy, what brings me anxiety? And that's how they find where their joy is. That's how they find their vacation. That's a vocation. <laughs> that's how they live in that tension uh, between the chaos and the work. You'll all recognize this uh, as the letter from the grotto that Thomas Dooley wrote to Father Hesburgh <coughs> when he was dying from cancer. Uh, and I think if you read it through, um, I think he was very aware of the external versus the internal dimension. When the time comes like now, then the storm around me doesn't matter. The chaos, the storm around me doesn't matter. The winds within do not matter. This, this angst existential angst that this isn't the way things are supposed to be. He names these, essentially, in that letter. A wilder storm of peace gathers. I think that wilder storm of peace requires that silence, just being with God, uh, just being silent. And these are the benefits of that. The unpossessable is possessed, and unspeakable is spoken, uh, because we silence that, that tension between logos and Dark wooden cross on an altar of boxes and high bonds of the magnificent, magnificent Sacred Heart Church. They are both symbols. This is something else there that counts. And I think that something else is this. I think that something else is the underlying logos, the underlying Christ at the beginning of time. Christ is there. I think a lot of you will be familiar with Frederick Buechner, an amazing writer. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And in the end, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is Christ, is the Logos, is the organizing principle. And in the end, that is the vocation, the calling of all of us to be Christ. To be Christ in whatever way we can be, and that can be as a surgeon in Kenya, or it can be as a receptionist in South Bend, Indiana, but to be Christ to other people. I want to thank you. And I also want to tell you, I can't, that was a, a sermon, but you still have to go to Mass tonight. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot.